I don't know if I classify as legally blind without glasses, but I can't read anything unless it's inches from my face, so it's all the same. To go a step further, I'm going to also cover my eyes with this. And tonight, I want to talk about me for a little bit. It's not something I would usually do. I would usually focus on scripture exclusively, but I'm trying something out a bit differently from the sermon before this one to the sermon after this one. I want to tell you about my first day of classes. My dad just talked about it. I'm in my first week at Georgia State. And my first day of class actually began with the preparation process. It was a day filled with a whole lot of unexpected situations. And I started my preparation process by packing my bag. And I decided I'm not gonna pack my laptop because I've, I've heard a lot about theft at Georgia State. I wouldn't want it taken. And until I have things figured out, I, I probably won't need it for the first class. I arrived to school about two hours early because I wanted to make sure I could get in the best deck. There were over 300 spots still left by the time I got there. <laughs> So now I'm sitting in the parking lot. It's about an hour early, and I don't know what I'm going to do. The night before, I thought I'll get there early, and I'll just sit in the library. I'll be on my tablet, and I'll do my work in advance. But lo and behold, I didn't bring my tablet. I decided, you know what? I was going to play basketball the previous night. Let me just go check out the rec center. I went to the rec center. I had forgotten my water jug. I was shooting around, and a fellow entered. And at first, I had underestimated him because of his slouched posture. I walked up to him and asked him if he wanted to play 1v1s. He said, yeah, but let me warm up first. When he said that, I knew that my underestimation was an underestimation. <laughs> we played two games. The first one, I lost 7 to 1. The second one, I lost 5 to 0. I went to my first class, sweaty and a loser. My second class didn't challenge me on a physical level, but intellectually. I had raised a definition in front of the whole class that I was proud of. They asked, what does race mean? And I, I basically described it as nationality. See, what I didn't know was that the teacher had specifically sent the class a video to watch before. And there was a definition clearly given, physical characteristics. So I was loud, I was confident, but I was wrong. That hurt me on a mental, a, a prideful level. After that, I, I sat with a group of students having a Bible study, and I didn't even realize it was a Bible study. And as I sat there, I was thinking, these youngins really love God. But what also passed through my mind was a message I had received about a month prior. And it was when I had told an individual about the goodness of God, and their response was, you don't talk about anything else, do you? I thought the same thing sitting there with them kids. Well, they were older than me, so I shouldn't really call them kids, but time passes. I'm supposed to be sitting here or going to meet a friend. They passed that up. So now I'm just sitting with the last person remaining from that group in silence still wishing I had brought my tablet as I've been sitting here for about 45 minutes now just on my phone. I looked at my work for my school. I was thinking maybe I could do something from my phone. It turned out at least everything required a video. And lo and behold, I left my AirPods at home as well. So I sat there, not really knowing what to do. And something interesting happened. The fellow next to me, though he had earbuds, he started playing a video on his phone out loud. It was a video of a group worship experience. And the video only played for about 15 seconds. But while he was playing it, I kind of looked up and I opened my eyes wide and I glanced around slightly because I was embarrassed. Embarrassed of my faith for whatever reason. And when the video had finished, the man simply had a smile on his face and he went back to doing his work. But I was embarrassed. Progress forward a little bit. The first thing I had been waiting for had come. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Club was meeting, and I wanted to be there. I decided I was going to be there even 10 minutes early. Met a random individual on the street. They looked buff. I was like, are you going to the wreck about to go work out? They said, yeah. I said, could I jump in with you? They said, sure. I said, give me five, 10 minutes. I'm going to go check out the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Club, then I'll come find you. 
I went to the club, I, I checked in, then I went back and I couldn't find them. As I was about to leave and just go back up to the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club, I'm walking out, there's this 6'5 dude, about 2'10, 220 walking in. He's just straight muscle. I'm thinking, I, I couldn't find the other dude, but you know, my dad used to say, if, if you're gonna ask somebody for advice, make sure they're in a place that you wanna be. Looked at that physique. I, even if it was on my 5'9 stature, that's, that's a place I would want to be. So I asked him. He was cool with it. We started talking. I asked him, did he play any sports? He said, soccer and judo. How about me? Basketball and I just checked out the Brazilian jiu-jitsu club. He was interested. He asked, was there a judo club at the school? I said, no, but the Brazilian jiu-jitsu club was open to all grapplers, whether it's BJJ, wrestling, or judo. He said, that's interesting. Should we go check it out and then we work out? So I went back up to the club a second time, and this time it was to participate, not merely spectate. I took off my shoes, I took off my socks, and before I got on the mat, there was a lady who walked up to me. She walked past him, extended her hand, and asked, what's your name? I said, I'm George. And lo and behold, she asked, you, you trying to roll? I said, I don't know what that means, but sure. <laughs> For reference, I've never trained Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've just used it in, in real life before. And the next thing I know, I'm in a headlock, tapping out. <laughs> She taught me a few things. I learned an advanced shoulder mechanism, and then I went to go work out with this individual whom I had just met. And it turned out that their warm-up was heavier than the maximum amount I could lift. It was hitting, again, this physical ego. But there was the last thing that I was waiting for on that day, and it was actually a worship service at the school. And the first song that was sang was about how God was enough. And the message was titled, you know, Why Believe? It was something like that. Why have faith? And I heard that and I was thinking, apologetics? That's beautiful. Especially since this is a college campus and, you know, most individuals fall out of their faith by their second year of university. Apologetics is just what's needed, especially for the first week when students have max entrance. He began to speak, but he wasn't talking about apologetics. He was talking about his testimony. He said, you know, sometimes individuals will have this 30, 40 second testimony, the real brief, concise one. Or maybe they'll have a full testimony in five to six minutes. But today, y'all are gonna get to hear the full, full testimony in 30 to 40 minutes. And the first question that he raised, though it was rhetorical, not the centerpiece of the sermon, was what makes you worthy? What makes you worthy? And I couldn't help but look back on the day that I had just lived as I sat there and think, man, I did it again. I misplaced the value away from God and put it on these earthly things. Whether it be my mind, and let's be honest, nobody's perfect, you're always gonna get something wrong. It's not that failure is a problem, it's how you respond to failure. And the physiques, I mean, there's always going to be someone stronger. It's a matter of if you're willing to keep pushing and growing. And when it came to the combat, we get so hyped up in our means of earthly self-defense that we forget an individual could just have a knife or a gun and it's done. You could be a back black belt in, in any martial art but when the trigger is pulled, if you're on the other end, that's a knockout, my friend. <laughs> and even then, if you had a knife too, there's, there's the saying that a knife fight goes like this. The loser dies in an alley, and the winner, the winner dies on the way to the hospital. <laughs> our protection be not in our flesh, it be in God. Because as far as we can see, our, our bodies are fragile. Like a vase, you just tap them, and they go falling over. There was something interesting, though, and it happened probably about a week before my first class. And I was talking with an individual as I sat at a table, 
And he began to talk to me about Genesis 1.17. He was talking about the creation account and how God said that man was made in his image. And when he began to talk, the language he was using sounded like he was basically going to say that men, men are little gods. We, we are gods too. That's what it sounded like, but you know, irrespective of if it's correct or not, you know, I thought at the very least, I'll hear him out. There's always something to learn and maybe I could teach him something. But he didn't go the standard route that I was expecting. He said, you know, man is made in God's image. We are gods. Now, not God's S, but God's apostrophe S. He began to say that man is made in God's image in the same way that a glove is made to fit a hand. We are made to be filled by his spirit. I have this glove right here. I'm gonna just put it on really quickly. Just like this. The glove without the hand, I mean, it's flimsy. It flows in the wind. It can go any kind of way. It doesn't really serve any purpose. But when the glove is on a hand, it takes shape. It has form. It has purpose. It, it guards. It cushions. It has use. There's a song by Kiara Sher titled, This Is Me, and one of the lyrics is, I am nothing without you, Lord, but with you I am something. In the same way that we are made to be filled by God's spirit, there's a whole lot of vanity without him, but with him, there's fulfillment. In this society, in this life, one cannot help but ask themselves the question of what makes me worthy and how much of it does. If it's money, you know, there's the Rockefeller quote from the interview. He was asked, how much money do you need for it to finally be enough? And what does he say? One more dollar than I have. It's never enough. It's never enough. You hit one max, and now you're aiming for the next high. You make one shot, and now you expect to make the next one. All that it does is raise your expectations ever and ever higher, but because we're human, we're not perfect, we have a limit, and that means that fulfillment, fulfillment is very fickle, my friend. So what, what makes us worthy? Who are we? Identity, who, who are we? Let's, let's go to scripture for that. And with the glove, I remove the blinds. Similarly, when we move in the world, we can be blinded. We think of various pleasures, but they're fickle, they're faint. You enjoy them while you do them and you regret them after. Short-term pleasures with long-term pains. But what about when you throw God into the mix? Hmm. So let's start. I'm gonna just go to the Bible app and I'm gonna start reading. I'm on Ephesians 1 and I'm gonna start at verse 3. Hopefully, I'll stop at verse 14. It reads, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. Immediately, that's it's kind of beautiful. Every blessing in the heavenly realms? There's a clause, of course, though, because we are united with Christ. What does that mean? It means if we stand alone, a glove alone, presumably those blessings be not upon us, but when the glove is in its proper compartment, the blessings are there likewise. It means that before you were born, before you were conceived, that God knew you. It meant that before creation, before the fall, God knew you and loved you likewise. Continuing, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belongs to his dear son. 
He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. And it reminds me of what Solomon said, the wisest thing a man can do is get wisdom. Continuing on, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Hmm. I'm going to pause here because I'm reminded of the first question I asked was, what makes you worthy? And I'm also reminded of the fact that that's not actually the scripture that tells us what makes us worthy exactly? It comes from Ephesians 2. I'm only going to read one verse. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. I can stop right there. But continuing, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. What makes us worthy? God did. God makes us worthy. Through creation, through proper purpose, God makes us worthy. Meaning in the world is fickle. One day they're telling you you're necessary and the next day they say you can just take the year off. We don't need you anymore. So many suffer through purposelessness because to be fair, this world is fickle. Very fickle. But God, he had a plan in advance for your life. But God, he knew where you would go. You see, there's, there's the Bible verse that those who are forgiven of much are more gracious, more grateful. Hmm. Even if you have walked a fickle way for a long time, have had your eyes covered for your whole life, and you think you've lived a long time. God knew you in advance. He knew what you would do before you came to him. He knew all the waves and the winds that you would ride before you finally ended up in place. God knew in advance. I didn't finish reading Ephesians 1, though. Let's, let's finish that real quick. From verse 12 on, God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So what makes you worthy? God did. Why are you worthy? You are his masterpiece. What's there to look forward to? Co-inheritance. How do we know? Well, you know, there's, there's a saying that I always say, works won't save you, but when you're saved, you'll do works. And you find it in community. You walk hand in hand with a brother in Christ because just because you claim Christ doesn't mean this walk gets significantly easier. When you claim Christ, the walk is only beginning. How can it get easier? You find strength in the Holy Spirit that you can walk. You find strength that your muscles grow capable to continue, but that don't mean it's easy. The burn, the burn is crazy. You know, there's probably nobody alive right now with big muscles who you'll ask him and they'll say, yeah, it was easy to get these. <laughs> you can't want the results without the process. Amen? Can't want the results without the process. We see all of this and we then ask, who are we? Of course, co-inheritors, of course, God's masterpiece. There are so many identities that are applied to people today that isn't who they really are. Means of confusion. Imagine if everybody went around and every job they had ever done was tattooed on their skin. It's not who they are. Their work, 
isn't them. Their gender it isn't them. Their sexuality it isn't them. And this may be a little controversial, but even their race isn't them. Who are we? God's prized possession. Children of the Most High God. And it sounds simple today, but many people don't live by it. Asked, who are you? I mean, I'm, I'm a black Christian, Republican. There's a many reasons, a many titles people will put on themselves. And what's saved for last? Christian. We are God's people. And as God's people, we are to stand together, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Not just those who are in the church, but even those outside of the church. Jesus told us to make disciples of many nations, to go and to evangelize, to spread the good word, to spread a testimony, to spread the reasons why Christianity is likely to be true. We are to be reminded that though we love others, it is in large part because God loved us first. You know, you can love someone unlovable for a day or two, but then you want nothing to do with them. <laughs> with God, you could love someone unlovable for a lifetime, and you wouldn't even mind doing it again. Hmm. What's impossible with man alone is made possible with God. Loving our neighbors as ourselves becomes a lot more easy when you think, I got heaven to look forward to. It becomes a lot more easy to think, I have done this many wrongs and yet God has still forgiven me. It becomes very easy to forgive your neighbor when you're reminded of all that God has to forgive you for. Hmm. Hmm. Who are you? Who are you? You are God's sons and daughters. What makes you worthy? You are his masterpiece. Claim him. It's not for everybody. It's for those who follow Christ. It's not by our works, but by Christ alone. Though again, those who are saved in Christ will try to live more like him. <laughs> And people aren't naturally like Jesus, so when people start to live like Jesus, you see the change. Hmm. Hmm. My time is running short. I'm on my last 30 seconds. The title of this sermon is My First Day. For on my first day, I went around uh, many ways of the world, was even ashamed of my Redeemer. But in the end, was reminded that God is more than enough, that we are his chosen people. Amen? Amen. Amen.